I said, my, that sounds very much like that old history four years ago. And the Lord spoke into my heart and said, yes, and you thought she was crazy. Because I said, that lady is maybe crazy, or there's something coming up that I don't see today. And uh, I certainly did not. I didn't see what was going on. Come. But from, from 1977 till today, we have been privileged to travel. And of course, traveling is not much. It is to represent the kingdom. You can that, do that outside your door. Of course, you can start doing it here. But it's outside there that you will really show what God has done in your heart. This, I consider God's workshop. Here's where you come, and uh, you are instructed, you're told in a perfect public way, because uh, a ministry will help out. They're not there to be your king, they're only there to be your, your servant. And uh, when we serve each other, then the Lord can operate in our life with uh, the nine gifts of the Spirit, and uh, instruct us how to live, how to conduct our lives, how to display our words and the actions so that we can be servants of Christ. And remember, the least little child is a servant or a maid of Christ. And you marvel the saints in the Spirit. Just let the Lord work in your life and leave it to Him. Play himself through you. And you'll be surprised to see what God can do. Hey, I've been amazed and surprised so many times I can't count them. And it's more than ten times. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So it's wonderful to be here in your midst again. And that will be our brothers uh, from around Manila and also every local person that really stays true to the gospel. Yeah. Remember, when I see familiar faces, I rejoice. I rejoice with a new face, too. Yeah. But it is. <laughs> but it is wonderful to see someone holding on, right. stable, right. have a dry, fire, walk to the Lord. Yeah. And I say, keep doing it. It's going to be rewarded at the end. And I'm pleased to be a part of your uh, wonderful efforts of the gospel and uh, to just be a supporter of what Christ is doing in your area. I I'm happy for that. <coughs> Let us go to the scriptures this morning. And I want to take a little scripture in Acts chapter 1. Uh, for a certain reason. We believe that we have come to what we would call the end of time. And we don't hear, we don't hear me now. Okay. I'll just grab this one. And whenever you get this working, then I'll, this might be more stable, I don't know. Okay. Okay. When you go to Acts chapter one, you you will read a portion where Jesus Christ is walking with his disciples. It is after his resurrection. And uh, the disciples, they have uh, developed a thought while they were walking with Jesus before his crucifixion. Because when they started to understand that this is what the coming Messiah, they had hopes. Now things would change. But of course, because of prophecies, uh, very few people have distinguished back in the Old Testament 
that Jesus Christ will actually come two times. And of course, when he hasn't even come one time yet, they were not too concerned about how many times he was going to come. Because they, they were still expecting, expecting him to come the first time. And when he came, then all the disciples got real happy. And since they knew what the prophets said, they were expecting him to be the ruler over the kingdom to come. And then when he was crucified, they got so dis disappointed and dismayed, they didn't understand that he had to die. So therefore, when you look at the scripture and the setting after his resurrection, all the disciples were just disappointed, confused, and didn't know what to believe anymore. And Jesus came and he walked with the two men that went to Emmaus, and they said, haven't you heard what has happened in this town about the Messiah, about Jesus Christ? And they crucified him. And we thought he would be the one. But to them, they have lost track of what God really had his purpose to do. So Jesus, he just walked with them and he said, that, Did, Didn't you know why this happened? And he went through all prophets and testified about his coming and his crucifixion. And he mentioned the prophets to help them to understand. And in this way, he opened their understanding, understanding that he had to come and die and resurrect to set up the kingdom. And then, when they finally understood, they, they were just so blessed and so thrilled. And when he disappeared, after praying and breaking the bread, for them, they just rushed back to Jerusalem to tell, we have seen the Master. And uh, that kept their hopes up for the coming of the kingdom. And here we read it, <coughs> and they said, well, let's see here now, in verse 6. That's what it's Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father hath put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in, and in all Judea and Samaria, to the end of the earth. Amen. Father, I pray that you will take this word. Help us, Lord, see and understand. So confusion will not hit, and people get dismayed and exhausted by waiting upon your coming, but that every soul can rely upon the infilling of the Holy Spirit and how to display their life and to fulfill the commission of their life. Father, touch each and every soul this morning and speak to us in a way and in simplicity that everyone can go out rejoicing in vain. That is my prayer, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right. We read a little scripture here. And how that they were asking Jesus, and that tells me that the disciples really didn't know how this was going to be saved and fulfilled. They were asking the question, and I believe people are asking questions today. Remember, you have been now in a truth and have received a gospel and very unique. Now, the gospel has been unique all the time, but according to the seasons of time, 
but chose for the body of Christ to receive a special blessing so that it would not just collapse and cave in. Remember the, the 19th or the 20th century, 1900s, have gone through really an ordeal. There were two world wars, devastating wars of this continent and of this globe. And there have been many rivals. And every person that has, are concerned about the gospel through the years, if you go two or three hundred years back in time, the people have believed the coming of the Lord. And they were seeking God, they were reading the scriptures, they were praying, and asking the Lord to give them directions so that they would have something to bring to them. And remember, I think that in the late hour that we live in now, people are more desperate than they were 300 years ago for the coming of the Lord. Because this world is growing more and more food. Natural. The spiritual, if people claim to have a spirit, it is evil. The spirit of the Lord is kind of fading out right. in the minds of the people. You got the television program. It's all about spirits, speaking to the dead, yeah. uh, all kinds of programs on, on fruity things, and the simple gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is out. Well, it seems like we have won the world. <laughs> but remember, we are all numbered by millions and even billions. But of course, God, He will take what is nothing and make something out of it. So it doesn't matter who bold this world is. This is the world that God is in full control over. But he has given man an ability to make a choice. And that choice has become man's predicament. They have chosen the natural things over the spiritual. And they're going their own way and they're going to a way of destruction. But, of course, some years ago I didn't even know that myself because I was just brought up in this world as a worldly boy. But it took the Lord to come and reveal His presence to change me. And that's what it takes for all of us. The Lord needs to come and change us by experience. I've always believed in experience. And uh, if you haven't experienced Him, you can now, because it's still here, and it's still in business, still working, his office is not closed. Right. Praise the Lord. Okay. All right. So, through the years, people have looked at the coming of the Lord, and you have probably heard a lot of different uh, foretellings and predictions that the Lord is coming. And uh, in my little possession here, I have a little, little pamphlet with a library of date centers of the common of the Lord. And I can tell you, it's about 200 of them. And there's probably more predictions about the common of the Lord. And it started, remember, in, in Paul's letter to Timothy, he was uh, arresting the people and saying, remember now, there are some people that believe that the resurrection of the saints have already passed. It's over. So that was as early as in the days of Paul. And he lived approximately 50 AD or 50 to 60, 67. And they have already started predicting the coming of the Lord and some have said it's over now. That's almost 2,000 years ago. So it tells me 
people have been very enthused or trying a little bit to be ahead. Remember, there is a race going on. It is who is going to know first about the coming of the Lord. Yes, that's a race. And the smartest guy comes up, hey, he's not smart, he's very dumb. <laughs> but the smartest guy that can come up with a fixed date, he will have multitudes of people running after him. And it will kill his church or his campaign or whatever. If he can predict the coming of the Lord, my, he got his made. But of course, the tragedy is the date will one day come to a close. Right. And when the day is over and nothing happens, he'll be the most stupid person and everybody will leave him. But the insanity of that tribe keeps going and marching on. And there is really no end to it. And even in this message, where the Lord has inspired a wonderful servant to help the people to understand, you know, coming, coming to the close of time. And remember, William Brandon, when he preached, he preached with such an expectation that the Lord also felt he, he's not so close. <laughs> he's coming tomorrow. Or could he be right now? Back in 1962, he preached a message, sir, to this time. And my, he preached so the people were so enthused and excited. They believed that Jesus Christ was just around the corner. With the even in experience, January the 1st. And that was in December. But of course, he never said that the Lord was coming in January. But expectation is something that the spiritual mind always have had. But then you have the mental, natural mind who don't understand the spiritual mind. And if they hear something that can be used for the coming of the Lord, they will take a spiritual mind setting and convert it into a natural way of thinking and start producing an expectation that is out of the scriptures. It is not really scripture. It is only man's imagination. But, you might say, but shouldn't we examine the scriptures and see where we are in time? Yes, we should do that all the time. It is very important to know where you are in time. But when they were asking Jesus 2,000 years ago, almost, and they said, are you no setting up the kingdom? And Jesus said, it is not for you to know. Yes. Yes, amen. The only thing you should be concerned about is not dates, appearances, but being filled with the Holy Ghost. And I believe you're going to meet still a lot of so-called smart men and women who will keep predicting and come up with new settings of dates. And if you don't believe what they say, you will be out. It's almost like you're not a Christian. You're dead in hell because you don't believe our saying. Remember, every fixation of years is an heir. It does not help a person at all. William Bradham said a very simple thing. If the Lord was coming tomorrow, how would you display your life? And he took a simple explanation. If you have planned to plant potatoes today, and you knew it was coming tomorrow, keep planting potatoes. Now that was a very simple way to say, stay the same. Because you are safe in Christ. And for you to be desperate and start acting like crazy will not help the situation to bring you closer to God. Desperation is a different thing. 
Desperate to come close to the Lord. The second thing you should do right now. And tomorrow, right now. <laughs> and the next day, right now. That's the, that's the state of mind and heart. <laughs> to always have a drive exposed to God. And I'll, I'll always put it like this. If you walk and turn your face toward the Lord, you can keep walking and walking the rest of your life, and you'll still be walking closer and closer to God. But you turn away the other way, and you walk towards the fence. It's only one step, and you're at the fence. And you're a doubter, complainer, and nobody is good enough around you. So therefore, we need to have our faith Faith toward the Lord all the time and keep walking. And that's the only safe way to walk. And I can assure you, you will always get closer to God. Yet more happy. Um, I hope that you're more happy today than you were 10 years ago. Amen. Right? Amen. Don't just say, well, I was, I was happy 20 years ago when I came to the Lord, but after then I don't really know. No. Always stay close to him. All right. I believe that every person has a right to examine their life and try to find out where they are in time. And of course, since we are now in 2011, things, things have, have gone on and we have always had a wanted to know where we are in time. So therefore, this is the, the message the Holy Spirit has declared a certain season of understanding. We have learned to know that we have come to the end of what we would call the sixth day in a great week. Remember, the people don't believe in God, but every week they are experiencing God's masterpiece of how He has worked, worked things out. He set up a, a scale of time, and from His creation, when He put Adam in the Garden of Eden, and Adam and Eve, they sinned and was thrown out of the Garden of Eden. Time started, a timetable started that would go a certain length of time. And uh, I'm not going to use a lot of time on what happened way back there, but we have now come to a time where we are expecting the Lord to change things, the order of things. Man has no work in a, and labored in almost a week for six days. Six days of labor. And there is a seventh day coming that is called the Sabbath. And the Sabbath is going to be a millennium or rest. Well, there's going to be activities and it's going to be a big change. And Israel, from the day they started to understand God's great plan, they have been waiting upon that seventh day, the Sabbath. All things since they started understanding. And since they are this close, to that seventh day, at the end of the sixth, people are running wild to try to find out when the change is coming. That is why people have started a very crazy way of predicting the coming of the Lord. And remember, no, the Lord is coming. You just don't know the day nor the hour. We are in the season of time with the coming of the Lord. There have been people 
waiting for us that are trying to find out about this coming of the Lord. And when I read some history, I found a man that was born in the late 1700s. And his name was William Miller. And he was the father of the Adventist movement. You, you have some big Adventist churches around the world. There are millions of them. Remember now, you yourself are considered a small following of Christ. I mean, in numbers. You are outnumbered in so many ways, except for understanding the will of the Lord. <laughs> that, that's your privilege. You have the Catholic Church. They have almost a billion people. That's a lot of people. You are outnumbered. So if church was supposed to be democracy, you would have been outnumbered long time ago. But praise God, this is not a democracy. God has a different way of dealing. But this man, William Miller, when he started studying the scriptures, and I'm not saying this to just talk about history, and I'm not looking down on any Adventist person. It's not a message about tearing down people. And this is a message about how to look at the scriptures so you don't fall into the traps. <coughs> you have the liberty to go anywhere you want. I won't be there to, to stop you. <laughs> no, you have your liberty. But this man, very dedicated, he probably read the Bible and closed himself in in study more than any person that are in this room today. Right? Yes. Oh, you study more than me? <laughs> well, some people are very concerned. Remember the Catholic Church. They have some monks. We have set their lives aside. They live in monasteries. And they have secluded their life for the Lord, so to say. They hardly see daylight. They study, they study, they study. And, thus, and don't get nowhere. The dedication? Yes. Hey, you have, you have ready monks. They live secluded up the mountains and whatever building they have, they have dedicated their lives for spiritual things. So there's a lot of concerned people. And I just hope that the Lord can reveal His presence to some of them so that they can get some value out of their study. Because we can dedicate our life and we can set our life aside as much as we want. It is not to set your life aside that is the value, but it is to have contact with Him and have a communication with your Lord. Remember William Branham, one day he said in his heart, I wish I could live in a cave and just come down and preach to the people whenever I had a message, and then go back to the king. And the Lord said to him, that's not your ministry. You're not supposed to live like that. You are to display yourself among the people and show that Christ life dry on us in your everyday life. But hey, don't, don't go in cave and think you're spiritual. Because that's not it. Alright? So to so this man, he wanted, he wanted to know where he wanted to go. He started studying the scriptures and he came to Daniel and the book of Revelation. Those are the two books of the Bible that have some years, numbers, figures. And when he saw the figures, 
He was trying his level back to find out. Remember, if you were living in 1790, for example, well, now you're living in 2011. And to you, what happened a hundred years ago is not that important, because that's over now. So you would like to find out what is God going to do today, and what not. Because now I want to focus and try to find out what God is about to do. And then of course you need some importance, something that can help the people to get confused. And when that man was studying, he found some figures in the Bible, and that was in the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel. And the special numbers that he saw was the figures of days. And one figure was 1260. 1260. All right, that might not mean a lot to some people, but to him, when he started studying, and he found another number, and it was 2,300. And when he started, and what he did was looking through history to see if there was something going on in life that he could compare that would bring him up to the day that he was living in. Remember William Branham? He preached a sermon and he told the people, he said, I think it was when he was preaching on the seventh week of Daniel, he said, I got, I got a little secret to tell you that. And he said he was, he was reading a book of a certain man and in that book he found out that this man had was able to account, to find out for many years it was from Abraham to Jesus Christ. And in the book he found out that from Abraham to the death of Christ was 1964 years. So if you do, if you take that as a measuring rod, right? 1950, and you go, Abraham to Jesus Christ. Hmm. 1954. And then he went like this. From Jesus Christ, 1955, four years up, and he came to the year 1977. And of course, that enthused him. <coughs> happened in 1977. And you all know what happened in 77, right? Nothing. Nothing happened. And if you're honest, you just have to admit, nothing happened. But some people, they never give up on years. And if they can't get one thing to happen, they'll make some other things to happen. And that's the, that's the insanity of tradition. When people get smart, they'll try to level back and find some explanation to it. Mr. Miller, he was looking back in time and he found a very specific thing happening back in France. In the year, let me see, I wrote it down here, in 538 AD. Really, it was the defeat of the Ostrogoths. Really, the Catholic Church started having an impact on the world. There was no Catholic Church at the day of Pentecost. Well, of course, there was a lot of Catholics there. Because Catholic means original believer. But some people stole the word and they put a denominational impact to it. So when you say Catholic, that's wrong. The only thing that's wrong is organization. 
but the name itself is okay. Right? It's when you put it in an organized way, right? Pentecostal is a good word, but it can be organized and strangled and framed, and the Spirit cannot use it anymore. Hey, the Spirit will use Pentecost, but it will not use the organized thing, the framework. We can take any word and, and destroy it. <laughs> you cannot destroy the word itself, but you can frame it in and make something else out of it. So, but in 538, it was really a forceful, should we say, start of an organizational structure. The Catholic Church, really, or the structure was founded way before that. But then it materialized in a very heavy way. And for the next 1,250 years, because that was Mr. Miller was out after. Where can I find a time season where 1,260 in? And he found the year 538 as a spring or like a, a shocking year where he felt, oh, I found a year. Like this man that Brother Brandon mentioned, he found a time chart 1954 years. And oh, no, I got something to work on. Remember, if you're going to be a mathematician, <laughs> You need some figures. You cannot take zero and add zero and get anything out of it. You need some figures. Of course, I'm not a great mathematician, so don't uh, <laughs> expect me to, to show you some figure test. <clears throat> but those things are the very things that people go by. So Mr. Miller, he found the year 538. And he was looking up and said, I have now come to the year 1798. From 538 and up the years, he, he came because that was his calculation. <clears throat> and he found out that there was something going on within the structure of the Catholic Church. And in 1798, he called it, let me see here, the capture of Rome by Berthier. So really, he looked at a, a strike at the Roman Catholic Church, where it lost its influence. But well, everybody knows that we have had a reformation. And the Reformation, Martin Luther was the reformer. And he brought the Christian world out of the Catholic way of thinking. He challenged the big church, and they tried to get him and kill him. But he was not the only one. There were many people, reformers, who tried to level that to live simple by the scripture, because the Catholic Church had stolen the liberty for the people. They were strangling the people and putting them under pressure. And that was really the tactic of every person who is trying to observe authority over your life. So remember, the Catholic Church is not the only system that is trying to strangle people. Every organized system is trying to serve authority of your life. And you're not supposed to be pushing <laughs> around. You're supposed to find Christ and live directly, inspired by the Lord, and walk on with Him. You'll still be associating with people. Because if you truly follow the Holy Spirit, 
The Holy Spirit has more than one person in this world. That's you, right? No, the Holy Spirit has many people who want to walk with Him. Therefore, when you start walking with the Lord, led by the Holy Spirit, you will meet people. And they will not want to be your Lords. Any person that claims to be your Lord and your mentor is really not led by God. Real people, Holy Ghost filled people, they want to be your servant. They want to serve you, to help you. There was some strange thing with William Branham. People who came to him, when he had been talking to them for a while and they left the home, they left liberated, joyful. They got an answer from the Lord. It set them free. Some people you meet today, they strangle you. They capture you. They make you an enslave. It's a difference. Amen. And it's not very hard to find out if someone wants you to ruin your life. Or they want to serve you. Is it? How smart do you need to be to be a Holy Ghost filled person? And walk with the Lord in the right way. You need to be simple. You don't need to have all the skills of this world. I hope you understand what I'm saying now. Alright? So, Mr. Miller, he found out that he had an answer to the 1260 days. But really, Miller lived in 17, uh, yeah, I think he was born in 1780 somewhere, and he died in 1849. So he had been dead 100 years when I was born. I'm born in 1941. Now, and you say, Rob, are you smarter than Mr. Miller? <laughs> right? He has already figured out a hundred years before I was born. He was there. And he has figured out about the coming of the Lord and the great controversy in the Catholic Church and the system and everything. And when I came to the Lord some years later and started reading the Bible, I found out there was a difference. Because Mr. Miller he got very displayed. His prediction did not help him. And he took one set section was 1260. And then, and he gave some answers to it. We might come into that later on. But for now, then he took the 2300 days. He says mornings and evenings in the Bible. And he found out, and that is in Daniel chapter 8, verse 14, if I'm not wrong. <coughs> there is where the angel of the Lord speaks to Daniel about a tragic event and how that things will be so bad and it will take a certain length of time and then things will be restored. And then there was a sound in the spirit world, hold on! Till it's all over. And the voice said 2,300 morning and evening. And the restoration will come in. And when Mr. Miller said that, he tried to find out, well, when would this start? And he found out a figure for a year, and he mentioned 457. B.C. That was a wrong... Well, Daniel lived in 550. But it had to be with, do with the restoration of Israel. Remember, Israel was led into captivity by Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king. And then after 70 years, they were allowed 
come back to the land. And they came back to the land approximately 536 or somewhere around there, BC, after 70 years. But the land was not restored in that particular year. It took some years. And Mr. Miller found out that the pendulum, the time, the clock, started in 457. Remember, this is not a revelation. This is a prediction. Right? I'm telling you how people count. So don't take this year, so I said, well, the struggle says it is 457. Now, it was Mr. Miller who said it. And then, it took 2,300 years, and it came up to 1844. That was the 2,300 years. And when he lived, when he found out that, he was now living in approximately 1828. So it was, uh, it was about 16 years later, that the coming of the Lord would come. So he, he predicted the coming of the Lord. And he said the date of the coming of the Lord. He said the Lord, well, he started out in the spring of 1844, but they ended up setting the date in October the 22nd, 1844. And you know, when he started preaching that, he got, he filled up every church building, every cathedral, every campaign that there was, because they had a year. <clears throat> People, they left denominations, they left the big churches, and they came to watch Mr. Miller's, and they were all excited. The Lord is coming in the fall of 1844. And you know what they did? And I'm telling you this. Because you will be pushed to conclusion by people. People, hey, they never give up predicting years, months, and days. People are crazy about the coming of the Lord. Therefore, they will try with every means to find another day. And they want to be ahead of the rest of the game. But that's not going to work. So Mr. Miller, he gained so much crown and popularity that my, the Lord just had to come. <laughs> but October 22nd came, and so this is your, you're here. You're not in the religion yet, are you? No. And Mr. Miller, he found out what did he find. But instead of collapsing or just <clears throat> humble himself and say, I'm sorry, I was wrong, they started to examine. And they started to try to find out. Since the Lord did not come physically down, there was something else that happened in 1844. And they changed the message till the coming of the Lord in the sky and not down to earth. The Lord just came halfway down. That's pretty smart. Now, he can hang there and be your judge. And if you don't believe it, you'll be judged. Hanging there. And you know what they call it? Perusia. Have you heard the word Perusia? In our day? That's a substitute for the common of the Lord. When you don't come, they change it to a Perusia doctrine. Really, Perusia is the Lord coming 
down, but not down to pick you up. Just to be a judge. And Mr. Miller and the Adventist movement are preaching and teaching today that there is a judgment upon the world, and it started October the 22nd, 1844. And the Lord is now examining people <laughs> that is going to judge. That's an ongoing thing that's been going on for the last couple hundred years. That is what the insanity of prediction will lead to. People, they don't surrender. I came to the Lord in 1967, uh, but in 1973, I went down to a convention and was re-baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And in the very same week, a brother came to me and he said, Brother Son, do you know we have come to the end of the world now? Well, first we are at the end. But how many years or months or weeks is it to the end of the end, right? And he said the end, this was July 73. The end is coming of the August the 26th of 73. Just a month up the road. God could have judged this world. And he said, and Denmark, you know the country of Denmark, up in the Scandinavian, Copenhagen. And that's later, Denmark is going to go in the ocean. It's almost like, hey, now you know about tsunamis. You heard about them now, they Since 2004, tsunamis have been a vocabulary that is known to people. But he was predicting that the a tsunami or the, that Denmark would sink in the ocean by August 26th. Why do you think he said that? Because he believed the millennium will start in 1977. And since they had a belief that there is a great tribulation coming, and the great tribulation has to come before the millennium starts. And it took three and a half years. Like, remember, 42 months, 1260 days? That is really the impact of the Antichrist. You will have the 70 weeks of Daniel, and the last week, there will be two prophets. They will have 1260 days. And you will have the Antichrist. And you will have 1260 days. And they are not going to cooperate together. Now, the two prophets are going to be instruments of warning the believers, really warning the, the nation of Israel, basically. And then, when they have warned the nation of Israel, the devil will inspire the Antichrist. He'll come down and he'll kill the two prophets. All right, and Mr. Miller has some things from that also, but we'll not mention that now. And then, the next 1260 days will be the coming of the Great Tribulation. And then, the Millennium will come. But I'll say, how can people take statements and not take the whole thing? Remember, the Bible is not just Pick and pay. Random pick a scripture. It has to line up. And if you remember, read your Bible. I hope you read your Bible and pray. And when I started listening to this, I could easily say in my mind, well, if the Great Tribulation will start August 26th. Then, where are the two prophets? 
That should have been done for two and a half, three and a half years already. I, I don't hear the sound of the prophets in Israel. So, but the people, they, they don't look at the continuation of Scripture. They, they, they pop up with some idea. They pick up a little Scripture, and then this is the truth. Remember, 1991, there was that attack on Sarah Hussein, went to Kuwait, and he, he, he just took the country. Then, the U.S., the British, the people, the Allies, they came in and they helped Kuwait. And, Saddam Hussein was driven out of the land. He had to go back <coughs> to Iraq again. But, before he left the country, he set on fire all the oil wells that he could get. And Kuwait was a smoking disaster for weeks and weeks. And you know, some preachers, they just jumped to a conclusion and they said, Hey, this is Revelation chapter 9. Out of the pit shall come a smoke like a furnace. So when they saw smoke, they randomly picked a scripture in the Bible out of its context and made it sound like now we are in Revelation chapter 9. But Revelation chapter 9, where the smoke comes up, is in the middle of the seven just people dashing. So then the middle of the week of Daniel must have been in 1991. And where was that he was now? Way in the millennium. I hope you understand what I'm saying. <coughs> you take the scripture and say, ah, I know what that is now. But you did not consider all the other events or scriptures. Remember, the summary of the scriptures will bring you to the truth. It will line up. There is a continuation of fulfillment in the scripture. Hey, we are waiting to see how God will do it. But then, if we try to be smart, I know what God's going to do. If you really doubt then you just make fools of all this stuff. And August the 26th, 1973 came and went. And Denmark was still there. And to this day I see still see Denmark on the map. When you fly over there, I see the land here, Denmark, hello, there you are. And this is 2011. But the strange thing is, the ones who predict, they never came in. They just start to recalculate and to give it another impact or another understanding so that they can keep being interesting. But I'll say, if people erred in their prediction, you better leave it. Because it will never help you. You will just get more and more And in 73, when I saw that, I heard the people say, well, but it's going to happen in 77. It has to happen in 77. Because the prophet mentioned 77. I predict that the millennium will first arise in 77. Nothing happened. They even had a little book that told 77 reasons for the Lord to come in 77. Okay. There can be a hundred reasons for things, but you only need one reason, and that's the truth. He's coming when he's coming. Yeah. 
And the next time you hear a prediction of years, don't run for it. And oh, you're not a believer. Hey, you're a believer. You believe in the coming of the Lord. And he said one thing. Be sure to be filled with the Holy Ghost. That's not the message. You need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. That's the only sure way to be filled. <coughs> it is not knowing dates, predictions, or days, or whatever. And remember, when those things didn't happen, I mentioned Mr. Miller and what he did. When the coming of the Lord did not come in 1844, he changed it. And he, he was giving a scan in the Bible again. And he came to a setting in Revelation chapter 14. You know what the Revelation chapter 14 is about? It is about angels. The three angels that is going to blast the last warning over the people. Warning them not to take the mark of the beast. And whoever takes the mark will be judged accordingly. Three angels going to fly over this earth and inspire people so they will not take the mark of the beast. And Mr. Miller said, well, since judgment is not set, well, the Lord never came, so I cannot say that he came and raptured us, but he came down, and he's not judging us. And they moved Revelation chapter 14 back to 1844. <coughs> you take the scripture out of its context, and put it in a different season of time, and Mr. Miller and Ellen White, the lady, the, the Adventist lady, she has probably more than a thousand experiences and prophecies and dreams and visions. Hey, nothing wrong about dreams and visions. It's how you interpret it. How it is. So this Mr. Miller and Ellen White, they came up with the conclusion, of course, they did not collaborate together. Ellen White was, was a much younger person. She came more heavy in at a later time. But, they started saying that in 1820, the starting of Revelation 14 was in. The first angel started in 1820. The second angel started his message approximately 1843. And the third angel is blasting from 1844. And of course, it's still blasting. And if you see on your gospel channel, television, there is a television broadcast system that is called Three Angel Broadcast. That is the Adventist Church system. And they are still hanging into the three angels that are judging the world today, started approximately 1820 to 1844. Brothers and sisters, that is a lie. The three angels have not even started yet. The three angels are going to start in the middle of the seventh week of Daniel. It is the last 1260 days of world. Well, I can't say history because not history is still prophecy. But world events to come, the three angels will be a warning sign. And remember, you will not hear the angels from heaven like this, like flying over your head. 
They're going to inspire the hundred and forty four thousand Amen. Jews. That's gonna be inspired by the two prophets. Amen. That's gonna preach in the first part of the seven days of that. Amen. So there is a seven year period before the millennium can come. And there is a rapture. <laughs> before the seventieth week will go into full black. So there, you have a lot of events coming. The people, they use their skill to try to find out the areas of predictions. And when you see that thing going on, you may wonder, where are we in time? People are it just lets us all understand people are, they are now crazy. They are so busy trying to find out <clears throat> when the coming of the Lord is that they will take scriptures out of its context to try to build something to scare you off. I mean, it's nothing to be scared of. There's nothing to be scared of now. The only thing you need to do is to walk close to the Lord. That takes your frightening scare away. You came to the Lord, and you start having joy. Remember, the church is not going to be ruled by fear. Like a scarecrow. Preachers if they don't have a message, they like to scare you to death. But if they got one, they can comfort you. <laughs> of course, a preacher will not tell you, live out in the world and have fun. Well, that's not the message. You come close to God. But it, it is to bring you to harmony with God. That's the purpose. Come close to the Lord. Get filled with the Holy Ghost. Prepare yourself to be ready for the coming of the Lord. There's many ways to invite people. You can get them out to death. You can run them off the door. And you can invite them to the real gospel. So, they teach Revelation the different chapters and the pick out events that they feel can be useful. And they build big organizations out of it. And millions of people believe in it. Because the people don't read their Bible. Yeah. They don't study. They're not on their knees anymore. I cannot say person. Get on your knees. And you don't need to stand on your knees, but in a spiritual way, on your knees. Study the scriptures. Pray. Seek God. Remember, when I was 18 years old, I wasn't even a Christian. Had no idea about the Bible or nothing. And then the Lord spoke to me and woke me up. And I read it to him, and I said, Lord, now I know you're alive, and from now on, I'll buy a Bible, and I'll read it, and I'll believe it, because you have revealed your presence to me. And when I started reading the Bible, I didn't, I didn't understand everything. I hardly understood anything. But I'm going to start reading. And while I was feeding, my heart was feeling as the Lord speak to me. Speak to me. Audible voice, whatever you choose, or through the scriptures. Wake me up. And to my surprise, when I started reading, scriptures after the scriptures started coming alive. And I remember when I read that part in Acts chapter 2, where the people got filled with the Holy Ghost, 
And I didn't have a clue about what that was. And I said, Lord, that is very interesting. This thing about the Holy Ghost. Do I have that? Because the disciples believe that the Holy Ghost, the scripture says. And I said, Lord, do I have that? But I came to a conclusion. If I ask, it's almost like, do I have a hundred pesos in my pocket? There's only one thing to find out. Check your pocket. <laughs> right? And if you don't know, then you probably don't. So therefore, I said, Lord, fill me with all of this. If I did not have all kinds of grammar, understanding, just the desire, Lord, fill me. And one time in the Salvation Army, I was sitting praying my jewel, and suddenly the voice spoke and said, Pack your instrument. And ran down to another place, and he showed me the great picture and you shall be filled with the Holy Spirit. I just packed my instrument and ran down to that place, and right there, the Lord filled me with the Holy Spirit. I've told this story before. I don't know if you need to go into detail. But you see, if you actually need something, and you are open to the Lord, He will give it to you. That's what the Bible still says, ask, and it shall be given. This is that. You ask according to his will, he will give it to you. He will hasten to give it to you. But instead, these brothers and sisters, people are trying to level that, to find a way so that they can be the smart head. I know more than others. And through that, they become important men for a season of time. Because when tradition and date fell through, you're out. And they won't listen anymore. Well, I tell you, brothers and sisters, I don't know how much time I've used, but the this Mr. Miller, I don't say this to belittle people, but to wake us up to the fact that when we start a trail, one thing things to be fulfilled, and we go to extremes to get it fulfilled, then we will suddenly realize just make a mockery out of our own self. He will show us what we need to know at the right time. Remember when Moses was in, the, in Egypt? There was the right day. Oh yes, there was a day. The Lord said, tonight you shall leave this place. And, hey, when God saves it, it will happen. But it takes the Lord to inspire. And remember, He can inspire a person in Australia, in the Philippines, in Europe, in America at the very same instant time. And I believe the Holy Ghost will speak to the right individual and say, Now is the time. And we don't need to go around to be smart. You understand me this morning? All right, I got lots more, but I'm not going to say it all in just one service. <laughs> so I think I'm going to stop here and uh, leave you with this little thought. And remember now, it's not to warn you against the system. Because the system, hey, you should know that already. But traditions are something that has been said in the later years. And people are still trying to change things to make it whole water. You got 2004 and a half. And people still try to level that to make that happen. Seven years later, nothing has really changed. But people try 
to make an impact. Remember Mr. Miller? He made up Perusia. Perusia is a word that finds it virtually, but to apply it at its right time is a different thing. And there are more Perusias to come. <laughs> I mean, air. May the Lord bless you. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for looking our way, helping us, Lord, to understand the Scriptures, helping us, Lord, to see God's divine plan, not, Lord, in predictions of days and months and years, but how that you will fill your people with the Holy Ghost and help them to see what is not the road. Lord, touch my brothers and sisters this morning. Let them have this comfort inside that when you are ready to bring your bride out of this world, there is not one of them going to be left behind. Not because of predictions of days. Now, you will inspire each and every individual so they will be ready in season. Hallelujah for the great coming of the Lord. Touch us now, I pray, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Praise God. It is exciting, and um, I hope it challenges us, because you have to to know the result of false prediction. It ruined and destroyed people's lives. And some of them have been so devastated because many of them have uh, sold, their sold everything and a lot of things, you know, thinking that the Lord is, is coming. But when these things did not happen. Many of them went back to the world and were dismayed. And because of that, they had a negative thought concerning churches, Christianity. And some of them have become scoffers, saying, Well, I have heard those things about the coming of the Lord, and yet He hasn't come, so I might as well go back to the world and enjoy myself and have a good time. Remember now, you can have different reactions concerning this. You will have a reaction like there is no point of continuance and therefore I would rather spend the rest of my life in the world and enjoy myself or will push you to study and will allow you to realize that there is such a day, the coming of the Lord. We may not know the day and the hour, but we will know when it really is just in the corner. Because He has given us enough understanding to know when we are approaching the day of His coming. So, brothers and sisters, I hope that you're not going to take this lightly, but look at yourself privileged if you are and have found the truth. Remember now, before we close, it is one thing to believe a teaching, but I always ask the Lord where the teaching comes from, because people can make up their own so-called understanding. To challenge a teaching you will find yourself weary about it because people will always come up with excuses to defend what they believe. Hey, the Seventh-day Adventists, they have their ways of defending. Okay? And they will never admit that they have made a mistake. So it's the first thing you need to realize and to know whether the teaching is the food. Ask the Lord, Lord, is the man bringing the teaching your servant. Do you understand? Because if 
that person is a servant of God. If the Lord reveals him to you, because Romans chapter 4 or chapter 10 says, how shall they preach? Everybody can preach. Everybody can bring the message of the Bible, but Paul qualifies it by saying, how shall they preach? Except they are sent. So it is very important that the people or the tools or the vessels we listen to are servants of God. Because even the devil can use the Bible. The Bible knows a lot more verses than you do. He can quote a lot of scriptures. Isn't it? When he was deceiving the Lord Jesus Christ, he was using the scriptures. Is it not written? Is it not written? You see? So, even the even right, when you look at the devil's instrument, don't look at a person with a form. Because he can come in a very attractive way. Very deceiving. He can be so meek, everything, but discern in the spirit. And in the hour we're living in, there is a lot of voices, or there are a lot of voices that are out there who will tell you we got the right merchant. Amen. So pray that the Lord will reveal to you who his servants are in this end time. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So this is more like a teaching, which you normally hear preaching in, the, in Sunday morning. Brothers and sisters, but I hope and pray that this will inspire you and challenge you to study your Bible. Study your Bible. Amen. And pray. And pray. You know, and one thing else. There's not much people today who think that church is important. It is very important. It is very, very, very important. Brothers and sisters. I believe in all of my heart. And a lot of people were saying, church is business. It is not a business. If this is a business, brothers and sisters, this is the bad business to make money. You believe that? You believe that? This is a bad investment if you are in a business. You know why? Brothers and sisters, human nature tells you that people are lovers of their own self. They would rather spend their money for their own than spending it for something like this. You understand me? So, hey, get that out of your mind. If you ever think that way, straighten up. You're not supposed to even think in that terms. Hey, if you don't want to help, if you don't want to do anything for the Lord, that's your business. Praise the Lord. But remember this. Remember this. Just think about the goodness of the Lord. Amen. And if I have not known the Lord personally, where would my children be right now? Amen. It may not be financially. But just to know that my, my children know the Lord and they did not end up being dragged at it, it is already a big blessing. Praise God. Amen. So church is a big help. It changed my life. Brothers and sisters, you cannot change your life. Only the Lord can change your life. And, and the question was asked, how important is the Holy Ghost? It is very, very important. Because to have the Holy Ghost will allow you to enter into a covenant with God. <laughs> then, officially, you are a part of God's covenant. Amen. Amen. And you know what a covenant is? It is an agreement of two parties. Okay? It is an agreement of two parties. God presents His covenant to you, 
you accepted it voluntarily, nobody forces you, you sign up the document willingly, not forcefully. That's why I preached last Sunday night, why did you sign the document without reading it? You sign it when you give your life to the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. And when you sign a document, you ought to read what's inside of the document. Don't sign anything that you have no knowledge of. You sign it, and you are willing to abide with the provisions inside of the document. That's why I made mention last Sunday night. Sometimes we are guilty of breaching the agreement. You believe that? Praise the Lord. And you're going to say, well, I didn't know that. Well, ignorance of the law excuses no one. You ought to be what's inside of the cross. Praise the Lord. Amen? Amen. Because you have lived and signed it when you have said, yes, Lord, I want you to be the ruler of my life. Praise the Lord. And before we leave this place this morning, be sure you've got the Holy Ghost in your life. You might not say, well, Pastor June, will the Holy Ghost pay my bill? Will the Holy Ghost pay my debt? It may not. But the Holy Ghost will leave you how to pay your debt. Praise the Lord. Because it is going to be your guide unto all truth. Not only deep revelation, but a lot of truth in your life. Praise the Lord. Because a lot of people today are living in a lie. They lie about something inside of them. It's about time, brothers and sisters, to be sure that the Holy Ghost in mind. When you have it, when the rapture comes, you're going to be there. Praise the Lord. Amen. And maybe when you have the Holy Ghost, you will stop smoking. You will stop drinking beer. And you will stop going to all those crazy places out there. Amen. Brothers and sisters, because when you've got the Holy Ghost, brothers and sisters, hindi mo gustong gawing pinapa ang Holy Ghost. Amen? Because when you smoke, pinagawa mong pinapa yung nasa loob mo. Amen? Pinakalburo natin ang banal na Espiritu. Praise the Lord. So when you have the Holy Ghost, it will change your life. Babaguhin ang panlasa ko mga kapatid. Amen? You will love to be in church. You're not gonna be in church and looking at your watch. Tagal naman yung Brother Stoneman. Matapos. Meron pa akong appointment. Meron pa akong business transaction. Pero pang nakikipag-ino mga limang oras, kulang sa'yo. Totoo yun eh. Are we not guilty of that? We're guilty of that, brothers and sisters. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. If there is one into it, one way there is in the whole wide world, it's the church. Because it is the place where you learn to know God's Word, be in His presence, and brothers and sisters, hallelujah, have the peace in your heart. Misan, yung mailuman mo, pinabola ka lang eh. Pakit po, kipo, kipo, bigyan mo talaga po, kipo. Pero dahil ikaw ang nag-lipis, po, kipo po. Eh, mga niya. Amen po? Ayaw na ba din, wag tayo magpabola. Amen po? Amen po? Salapakan natin ang Panginoon sa Panginoon. Ang Diyos, hindi kayo nabibiruin. Sasabihin sa'yo ng Diyos, you're guilty. Wala akong magagawa, sinabi ng Lord, you're guilty. Sinabi naman ng Diyos, you have proof. Ito na, ito na proof ka naman. Kaya mga kapatid, let's seek God's approval, not the approval of men. Let us all stand. And if you have a need, don't look at your watch. Praise the Lord. Alam po ninyo,